our passage this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I noticed this morning it was on our, hanging on our cross. Let me read for us verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Um, a number of years ago, I don't remember how many, it's been greater than 11 or 12 because it was before we had kids and probably before I was even in the ministry, um, so maybe more like 15, Mary and I went to San Francisco. Um, she was there for um, uh, work, and so I flew out. We were going to spend a few days, and then uh, I was going to come back on my own, which I think might have been the first time that I ever flew by myself because I'm was i not a big flyer. I'm not, I like to walk. Um, well, I don't even like to walk, to be honest with you. I like to ride. I'm in a car. Not, I just like to stay at home mostly, but anyway. I'm not a big flyer was the point. But, um, um, so I remember, we, I remember went back to the airport that day, and I got on the airplane. And like before we even took off, uh, the pilot said, I just need to make you all a little bit, you know, aware of some, some weather between us. And uh, we were coming from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. So there's a big span there, but there was some weather somewhere there. And he was like, just wanted to let you know we may um, get into some rough weather, and, um, which is already making me nervous. That's the time that I would reach over and, and I'd grab Mary's hand. And so I reached, you know, reached over, and that, the ne- guy next to me didn't mind at all. I mean, he just, he was, no, I just not, that did not happen at all. That did not happen. Now, I think I was at a window seat. There was nobody to grab. But I would have grabbed somebody. But, you know, I start digging my hands into the deal, um, into the, the, the hand rest. And, um, but the pilot kept coming on, and we did hit some, uh, some bumps, and we dropped a few times, and, it, and it, it shook me up a little bit. But, but I was a trooper. I mean, you know. Um, and uh, anyway, we landed back in D.C., and, and everything was fine. But, um, you know, the whole part of that that was the worst part was just that anticipating like that, that what, when's that next bump coming? When, when's that next, that next little bit of turbulence coming? And, and I remember I had to anticipate that the whole way. It was like a five-hour flight, so it was a long, long deal. I also remember that we got back and we got on the plane from D.C. to, to RDU, and nobody said a thing about any turbulence, and it, was, and it was bumpier than the other ride. And I remember that we landed that day, and, and when we landed, we hit the ground so hard on the landing that the upper, that the containers above us came open, and some dudes, like, stuff fell out in front of us, and I remember that that was a lot worse, and I didn't have to anticipate that because I didn't know that was coming, but anyway, uh, the waiting, I think, I think the theologian Tom Petty said it best, the waiting <laughs> is the hardest part. Um, way back in the third chapter of Scripture, the Lord makes this promise. We mentioned it last week. It has a special name. It's called the Proto-Evangelium, um, which is, just means first gospel. Adam and Eve have sinned. They've done the one thing God told them not to do. They've eaten of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that single act of ab- disobedience, Adam and Eve are removed from the garden. You're sure, sure you know the story. All of humanity is cursed. Um, death, our great enemy, is now reality. It was not before. Uh, but God, in his great mercy, did not leave humanity um, without hope. The Proto-Evangelium, which was the first gospel, God makes a promise. Uh, speaking, we said this last week, but speaking to the serpent, God says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says, I will put enmity, speaking to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's this great promise right there in the third chapter of Genesis uh, that man will find himself in this cosmic battle with the evil one, with evil, and that the evil one will bruise the heel of, of the man. Um, that was a promise that the flight was going to be bumpy, that there was going to be some turbulence. But this wound by the serpent was not going to be the end of mankind. In fact, there was a greater promise embedded in there that if we're not careful, we, we miss. God promises that the offspring of the woman will not simply bruise, although it gets translated in the ESV as bruise, not simply bruise the, the serpent, but the NIV helps us see it best. It says he will not bruise your head, but he will crush your head. Head is what God promised that the woman's seed, the woman's offspring, sometime there would come someone who would crush the head of the serpent. The serpent, and this great promise right there, 
third chapter of Genesis, of the one who would come, who would crush the serpent, who would come and defeat the evil one, the one who would come and fully and finally put an end to sin, put an end to death, put an end to darkness, put an end to the powers of evil. This is the first gospel, the guarantee that there would become a Messiah, the guarantee that there was a promised one, the guarantee that the Christ would come and put all, make all things new. I think Rachel talked about making all things new a little bit earlier. This promise came with something else, though. The beginning of something else, that is. This promise came with a time of waiting, of waiting. Throughout the history of the Old Testament, we find God reestablishing this promise, this promise for a deliverer. And what we find God's people doing? Waiting. When God establishes his, his covenant with Abraham and and he, he uh, creates for himself a, a people group, which would be Israel. God reminds Abraham, your offspring will bless the world. There's that promise again, showing up. But then there's a wait. Every time God delivers his people from danger or slavery or for, from imminent death, it's a reminder that there's one coming who's going to put an end to all of this forever. And understandably, God's people waited. And they watched, and they anticipated, and they waited, and they watched, and they anticipated. Can you imagine every time somebody would rise to power or prominence in, amongst God's people, they would ask, is he the one? Is this it? Was it Abraham? Was it, was it Isaac? Was it Jacob? Was it Moses? Was it King Saul? I mean, he's our earthly king we beg for. Maybe it's King Saul. And then a man comes who is... Seemed to be the chosen one, a man that's labeled a, a man after God's own heart. He had to be the one, right? David had to be the one, right? But like all the others, he proved to be just a man. And guess what continued? The waiting. Through the ups and downs, through the peaks and valleys, and a whole lot of ordinary time in between, the people of God waited. Advent means the arrival of something. It means something or someone arriving. But the period of time that we call Advent leading up to when we celebrate Christmas really means waiting. It's a waiting period. By the time we reach Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, almost 4,000 years have gone by since God made that promise in the garden since the Proto-Evangelium occurred in the Garden of Eden. Almost 4,000 years since the promise of this one, this Messiah, this offspring of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, who would defeat sin and darkness and the powers of evil. Almost 4,000 years of waiting. There have been mountaintops. They've seen God work. They, they've seen God do mighty things. There have been prophecies. There have been fulfillment of prophecies. There have been miracles. There have been victories. But there's also been darkness. There's been death. There's been defeat. There's been a split in the kingdom. And through it all, there's still this promise. And attached to that promise, there's still this waiting. When we arrive in Isaiah chapter 9, things have taken a particularly dark turn. In chapter 7, we see that there's a new king ruling over the southern kingdom of Judah. His name is Ahaz, and we find out in 2 Kings chapter 16 that Ahaz was particularly evil. It says, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He led his people to idol worship. He desecrated the temple. Matter of fact, his acts of blasphemy are way too long for us to name this morning. In Isaiah chapter 8, things are really messy. Isaiah prophesied that, that due to the actions of Ahaz, the kingdom would actually fall at the hands of the Assyrians. So that kingdom that Ahaz is over, it's not even going to be there at some point coming because of his, of his disobedience, that kingdom will fall. And then in, and while in chapter 7, we do see there's a little bit of hope, by chapter 8, that hope seems to be all but gone. That, that hope seems to be an impossibility. Listen to how... Isaiah ends chapter 8. This is chapter 8, verse 22. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Now, I don't know about you, but, but let me ask you, have you ever 
felt like you were surrounded by darkness? You ever been in such a time when you were just full of distress? You ever found yourself maybe even being hopeless? That's where God's people were at the end of chapter 8. It would seem that this promise of this deliverer, that this promise of the Messiah, that this promise of the snake crusher was just a fantasy. And all this waiting they've been doing, 4,000 years of waiting, I mean, was, was it just a waste of time? What hope did they truly have? But then we find Isaiah chapter 9. And God's people are reminded that their hope, that their waiting is not in vain. Let me read for you even more of chapter 9. Let me give a verse 2 in chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. We see the change immediately. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot on the trampling warrior in battle turmoil and, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And right away we see it. There it is in verse 2. The promise again, this time of a great light that would outshine the darkness, a promise of joy, a promise of harvest, a promise of spoil. There, there it is, a promise of victory, a glimmer of hope in the darkness. And that hope is made real in verse 6. How? In the form of a child, a new king with a new kingdom. There's this promise of this Davidic king promised way back in the garden. Way back with the proto-evangelium, there's this promise again. And also promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7 to be in the line of David. Promised, in fact, over and over and over and over again in Scripture. The promised Messiah, the, the, the Deliverer, the Savior. Now, at first reading, we might read this and think, this must be a child of Ahaz. I mean, even as wicked as Ahaz was, maybe his son would be different. I mean, Ahaz was much different than his father. Maybe his heir would be their, their salvation. Or maybe this would just be another child in that line of David. You know, we get excited about the birth of a child. This is exciting. I mean, I don't, I mean, last year we, we, we had really I mean, 12 years, but, but we had our first like dedication or, or baby blessing, we called it. Like, and we had like, I don't know how many kids we had, but 9, 10, 11, 12, something like that, just kids. And there were more. Like, there'll be more this, this year, of course. And there are more here now. Then we're then, and we were we were so excited. I mean, you get excited about a baby. I mean, you get excited about seeing a new generation. You get excited to see things starting over. You get excited to see about it growing, and, and it's exciting, right? These people needed some hope, some good news. And what better news than to say, there's a child going to be born who will be your deliverer. But when we read it, when we read verse 6, it becomes evident. The description. The names, the titles here, this is no ordinary baby. Isaiah gives us four names for this baby. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look at each one of those individually. Leading up to Christmas morning, when we have one more name to look at. This morning, let's look at what it means that the promised one is a wonderful counselor. Now, what does that word wonderful mean? We probably hear wonderful. We think that means really, really good. Maybe we would say awesome. Maybe that means awesome or really, really good. And we wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but there's much more to this word than just really, really good. The Hebrew word here that's translated wonderful is pele. Um, it, it, in the Old Testament, this word is used. It means miracle. It means a marvel. It means the supernatural. And with the exception of one time in, in Lamentations 1, this is always, always talking about something that God has done. So always going to talking about what God has done with the exception of one time in Lamentations chapter 1. The root word here 
is used to describe times when God has moved in a mighty way. In fact, it's probably more when he's delivered his people. After the Lord split the Red Sea and delivered the Israelites uh, to the other side of, uh, in Exodus chapter 14, it, Exodus chapter 15 is a song that the Israelites and Moses sing. This is one of the, the lines, the lyrics of the song that they sing in verse 11. It says this, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? There's that word again. In fact, it might show up twice in that, in that verse. These wonders here that Moses is singing about, that the people are singing about, this is about God rescuing them and leading them. These were miracles. Like This word really means miracle. This wonderful here means something so extraordinary that it's difficult to even explain. Like, like when they got to the other side of the Red Sea, they couldn't look back and say, let me just draw you a picture of how this happened. No, God did that. This is a supernatural act of God. If you know anything about history, probably you know the seven wonders of the ancient world. I think they were identified maybe 5 B.C., but really came into prominence and people knowing about them in the second century. I mean, it's the Great Pyramids, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, um, Temple of Artemis, a couple of more. Um, people marveled at them. They were unexplainable. They were wonders, right? But ultimately, they were works of man. With enough research, with enough knowledge, somebody could reason them out. They could figure them out. I mean, with, with enough studying of them, they could, be, they could be replicated. You could do them again. You could build them again. But the works of God, they're incomprehensible. They're unexplainable. They're miracles. They're wonderful. That's what this word means. We cannot wrap our heads around it. It's that supernatural. It's way beyond what we can even imagine. The promised child, the Messiah, is a miracle of God. Jesus is the miracle that's being spoken about here. This is not just a child. This is the miracle child. Jesus is, if you want to use the word here, and, and we could, in fact, scholars differ whether it should be wonderful counselor or it should all be separate. Wonderful. Like that being a name in and of itself. Jesus is the wonderful here. He is the miracle. He is the supernatural act of God. This child is not ordinary. This child is supernatural. This child is extraordinary. This is a promise that there's a child coming that is unexplainable, incomprehensible. That's what wonderful means. What about counselor? Because we need to put these together. But what about counselor? What is a counselor? The Hebrew word for counselor is yavetz. It means a person trained to give guidance or advice, maybe a teacher or a mentor. Look, that sounded good to these people, I'm sure. They needed someone to lead them, to guide them. They needed a king other than Ahaz who would guide them. Ahaz is not leading them anywhere they want to go. They needed someone to help them follow the Lord. I mean, let's be honest. That sounds good to us too. We need a counselor. We need someone we can trust. We need someone we can talk to. We need someone to guide us and to teach us and to give us sound advice. The promised child would be that. Would, would, the promised child would be wise, able to give good counsel. This is Jesus again. We know that Jesus is wisdom. No, no, there's no getting around that. Jesus is wisdom. We can fully trust his counsel. We need that. And that's there. That's, that's good news that Jesus is a counselor that we can trust, that we can go to him with whatever we have to go to him with, that we can, that we can, that he is. He listens to us. He hears us. He, he, through his spirit, he guides us. He is a counselor like that. I read somewhere that a good counselor will listen, empathize, point a way to healing, perfectly balanced with grace and truth. That's what we get from the wonderful counselor. Jesus, who listens and empathizes and points us to himself, which is the, where, the, the spot of healing, and does that with grace and truth. But there's more. This is a quote that I read this week from an article on 1517. 
We don't expect that. We don't expect that as our counselor, Jesus not only listens and cares, but that he takes our place. He steps into our shoes. We aren't, play, we aren't paying him, him for his time. He isn't sitting across the room daydreaming about a te- his next tennis match or his lunch break, and he doesn't condemn us. As counselor, he fully knows us and loves us all the same. He understands our anxieties and our despair as his own. And in turn, he doesn't give us the right words of advice. He gives us something greater. He gives us himself. He gives us his righteousness. Counselor here not only means someone who gives good advice, it means advocate. It means someone who takes our place. This is someone who represents someone else, who pleads the case of someone else. The promised child would be an advocate for the people of God. He would represent them. He would be on their side. This isn't simply representation in a courtroom, like you have a lawyer. It's greater than that. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says this, an advocate doesn't simply stand in between two parties, but steps over and joins one party as he approaches the other. Jesus, yes, he stands in the gap between us and God, in that chasm between us and God. He pleads our case, absolutely. He represents us, but get this, he's on our side. He is for us. He's invested here. He isn't simply representing yet not caring. No, he loves us. He's for us. This is what it means that we have a wonderful counselor. We have a supernatural advocate. We have a miracle, a supernatural advocate on our side, sent from God. God in the flesh, standing in our place, on our behalf, for us, on our side, knowing us better than anyone and loving us more than anyone. God has sent his son, his supernatural advocate, the wonderful counselor for us. We have in this promise a supernatural advocate. The proto-evangelium, the first gospel, is the only gospel. It's the gospel that says Jesus took our place. It's the gospel that says Jesus is our supernatural advocate. It's the gospel that says Jesus came and lived a life for us. That Jesus came and died a death for us. That Jesus paid for our sin, my sin, your sin, all of our sins. That Jesus was raised from the grave for us. That Jesus defeated sin and death and and darkness and the powers of evil for us. That Jesus ascended to the right hand of God the Father, a position of all authority for us. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. It's the gospel that says Jesus promised that he'll return one day to gather from himself, for himself, from every tribe and every tongue, from every color and every creed, all those who follow him. Like that shirt said, I follow Jesus. All those that follow Jesus one day will be gathered together from every tribe and every tongue and live with him forever and ever in the new Jerusalem. That's what the gospel is. The gospel says we have a wonderful counselor, a supernatural advocate who says, I'm on your side. I'm on your side. I can take your place. Now, here's our question. Do you know him? Do you know him? Not do we know about the baby on Christmas morning. Everybody here knows that. Not do we know about the manger scene. We know that. Not do we know about the shepherds or the wise men. We know that. Do you know him? Not do you know about him. Not do you know the, the Christmas story. Do you know about him? Do you know, the, do you know him? Do you know the one who is the wonderful counselor who came to take our place? Who didn't just 
Spend time in a stables in our place. But crawled upon a cross in our place. Who was put in a tomb in our place. And who defeated sin and death and the powers of darkness in our place. Do you know him? That there are a lot of, of questions that you will probably you probably ask yourself every day, but none more important than that one. Do you know him? And better than that, does he know you? We we say it, you know, we 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 preach the gospel every week here. That's that's we don't have anything else. We don't have a plan B. There's no other gospel. That's it. Jesus in our place. That's it. Do you know that to be true? If you're here today and you're like, I, I, I've heard about this all my life, and, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're here today and this, this is the first time you've ever heard about this and you have questions about that. Would you come and talk to me? I would love to sit down with you anytime to have a more in-depth conversation about the gospel. But let me just tell you what you can do in the meantime. Would you just cry out to him? Even this morning, cry out to that wonderful counselor who does not turn his head, who does not pretend he doesn't hear you, who does not think about what he's doing this week and not listen, but hears you and knows you and loves you. Would you cry out to him this morning? Maybe you're here today and you're like, you know what? This was real to me at one time, but... but I just haven't really considered it lately. Would you, would, would you just cry out that the Lord would make the gospel new to you this morning? You know, I, I bet everybody in here could go back to a time when you're like, I remember that Christmas. I remember this particular time in my life, a marker or something, you know, where you're like, I remember what I did on that Christmas. And I, and I, think, uh, I think somebody up here spoke about a day. Maybe it was Rachel I was speaking about Emily about a day that she remembered when something clicked. But I bet you could go back and remember. I remember when I first heard that gospel. When it just when I when I heard it and it and it just it just grabbed my heart. Would you pray this morning that the Lord would just give you that? That you would just remember that time when when He grabbed your heart and said, I'm on your side. I'm with you. I love you. You're mine. That he would make that new to all of us again this morning. We have what we pray is another three, four weeks before we get to celebrate Christmas morning. We have a wonderful counselor now. We have a supernatural advocate right now who has taken our place. Would you cry out to him this morning? Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you love us. That you've shown us grace. You've shown us mercy. That you've shown us kindness. You've shown us love, immeasurable. Lord, we, we can't even quantify how much of these you have shown us, Lord. And it's so easy to take these for granted. It's so easy to forget, Lord, what you have done in our place. Lord, would you remind us of your gospel this morning? Would you remind us of who you are and what you've done? And then would you set a fire inside of us, Lord, that we might go forth from this place and proclaim that gospel wherever we find ourselves, to the masses, Lord, that others might know that truth and that you might, Lord, rescue more and more. You might bring those who are far from you near to you, Lord. Would you just use us? Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.